Hello, this is Brian Funk, and thank you for listening to the Music Production Podcast. I'm very excited to announce that my new book, The Five Minute Music Producer, is now available in paperback form, a real book that you can hold and touch and turn to any page you like in a second. And it's a pretty big book, 629 pages of activities, exercises, and wisdom I've learned over the years. It's available on Amazon.com. The Five Minute Music Producer is 365 music making activities that will help with your songwriting and music production. It'll help you fight writer's block, make more music, write better lyrics, develop solid workflows, learn techniques for generating ideas, and finish more music. It's like having your very own music production personal trainer giving you ideas and challenges each day. And the best part is the challenges are quick and easy and they only take a few minutes. So even if you don't have a lot of time, you can spend five minutes and advance your music production skills. There's no better time to improve your music than now. Imagine where you'll be after a year of these activities. The five minute music producer has hit the number one new release in the music songwriting and music recording and sound categories on Amazon. So check out the five minute music producer, 365 music making activities. It's available on amazon.com or you can go to brianfunk.com slash book. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the Music Production Podcast. I'm your host, Brian Funk. And on today's show, I have film and TV composer and a man of many other hats as well, Roger Neal. He's done a lot of great work, some films like 20th Century Women, Don't Think Twice, the new Darby and the Dead, which is a lot of fun on Hulu. Um, he's done all 13 seasons of King of the Hill, which is a great show that I've enjoyed very much. Uh, he's got a... He's a PhD, PhD in music and ha- from Harvard and um, done orchestration work, conducting and various other jobs for people like Beck and Michael Jackson. Maybe you've heard of some of them. Um, <laughs> so I'm very excited to talk to you, Roger. Thanks so much for taking the time. Thank you, Brian. It's awesome to be here. Thank you very much. Yeah, and you've got, um, you know, I'll just mention it for anyone that's watching, you've got a lot of fun stuff going on in the background of your studio there, a lot of cool <laughs> devices. And I think the first time I've seen someone else that has a lava lamp in their, in their camera. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's funny. <laughs> I, I, that's a recent installation. I do have a lava lamp in my studio. They used to be ubiquitous in every recording studio you would yeah. go to. <laughs> I was recently asked, uh, speaking of many hats, I was recently asked to DJ my high school reunion party so um so i set up my dj booth including buying a few lava lamps for that so that's the leftover from a from a union night wow that's fun (laughs) did you get to still um kind of like mingle with everybody or was that a nice excuse to avoid (laughs) such awkward things not only did i mingle with everybody somebody one of my um beloved uh former classmates gave me covid that night so yay oh no I heard uh, Dr. Fauci talking about he got when he got COVID a few months ago that he had also got his at uh, his high school reunion, mm. reunion. So let that be a, I guess, a cautionary tale to y'all yeah. out there. I guess so. Uh, particularly when you're dancing to old hits. <laughs> <laughs> well, old friends keep you know keep on giving. <laughs> yeah, that's why that's why we love them. <laughs> yeah. So I, I'm glad you're here to talk. Um, you've got so much cool stuff in your in your history and your work um you know it's kind of surprising as i kept digging finding more and more i was like wow really that too um i thought i might just ask you um where did you start with music so if there's so many different things going on what was kind of the first thing that brought you in yeah i've been, I've been a musician for friggin' forever and i started mm-hmm. as a kid you know um boy like in elementary school i just started playing just had a love for for music and it was um uh, uh you know like like fourth grade i started playing flute in the elementary school band that was where it started from so uh and you know for me personally i just was just kind of fell in love with playing music immediately and i, I excelled rather quickly once i decided to start playing an instrument and it was just really clear from the time i was about 10 years old that that was going to be my path mm. Um, and, uh, 
I don't really have any other skills that I've exploited or developed, you know, it's just the one. <laughs> and it was just, um, it was always going to be the thing. Uh, I, you know, as a kid, I think I wanted to be a rock star slash um, orchestra conductor. I think that was my, uh, <laughs> uh, my dream job, you know, maybe astronaut too. Um, but then, um, but yeah, as it sort of progressed through my education, I, um, I, I always had these very disparate interest in music in terms of styles like i was a serious classical player i played piano i played flute and i was a headbanging rock and roll punk rock guitar guy as a teen and also interested in just in jazz and synthesizers electronic music world music all sorts of stuff so um it just kind of occurred to me as i progressed in my training that um I wanted that I, I should find a, a path that would allow me to do a lot of different things and not get pigeonholed. And, and that's what led me in, mostly to film scoring. Like that was the one thing where, where in a way you could just do, you could wear different hats musically with each new project. So, um, it just fit, it fit me. You know, I, I think, um, I think at one time again, like I, I probably imagine myself being like, um, a touring rock musician, but um, it didn't, didn't go that way. And this ended up being the career that really, really stuck. And, and frankly, gave me a lot more longevity uh, than any other career choice I could have. And and I'm very, very grateful to, to that now, because I have been around, as you observed, been around a while, you know, I've been doing lots of stuff. And I just feel like I'm just as busy as ever. And it's, it's, it's uh, very grateful that it just continues. Hmm. Yeah, I could see how having all those different interests would lend itself to film where you get a different project. And there's so many different styles, even sometimes in a, a single project, I'm sure, that yeah. you have to cover. Yeah, you know, and part of the job, I'm mean, we'll probably get into this, but let's do it now. Part of the job of, do, of being a film composer is finding a voice uh, in the music, finding an, an identity in the music that's unique to the storyline and appropriate to the storyline and the characters. And that can be real, a real process of a process of exploration and collaboration with your, uh, with the filmmakers. And, uh, you need to be nimble to do that, you know, um, because you might start a film thinking it's going to be this kind of music. And then you realize it's that kind of music. And then it turns out being something different. So, mm. um, the more versatility you have, the more successful you will be, um, that's a truism and then also just sort of mixing that uh balancing that with um having a voice that is unique to to yourself i mean that's also important if you're a jack of all trades as an artist um that can be useful but also means like well what is that what is the thing you do what's that one thing you do and uh you know you have to have something that, that is like unique to you otherwise um you're not going to get the attention you know you're not going to get the uh, the jobs you want yeah, that seems to be a common bit of advice people give is it's very tempting, especially these days when you have software that can cover pretty much any genre you're interested in. It's tempting mm -hmm. to just try to do a little bit of everything and make your rock opera, hip hop, you know, <laughs> classical, whatever you want to do in one four minute little uh, swoop there. Yeah. But it seems like um, that's a big part of the... Um, thing that separates people out is when they kind of find their spot and they work on that and develop that rather than kind of tap into little things here and there over time or at least it makes it easier to know who you're dealing with in those situations yes yes um no honestly it's a good point because i bring this up because it is had in some ways it's been a challenge that i've needed to overcome through my throughout my career which is that i I can do lots of things. You know, I'm very comfortable writing for orchestra and leading an orchestra. I'm very comfortable playing guitar and bands. I'm, I'm good with synthesizers. And uh, in my studio behind me, there's lots of modern and, and very vintage gear. Um, I've traveled the world involved in, in world music cultures. I've done a lot of, a lot of different things. Um, so, but, it, but again, it's like, um, you have to find some way to mash that all together that, that you have like a singular identity that you have sort of like something that you do which is your special sound um and um 
I feel like I've been I've been more successful with that, with that creating a personal identity later in my career than I was at first. I think at first I just had too many different things I wanted to do. I was like, oh, I want to do this, that, the other thing. And I did all those things. Um, but you know, uh, and I still love doing that, you know, as much variety as possible, but it's also so crucial to have the sort of like your own universe, this which is your your sound. Mm. Well, how would you define that then now? Well, I hmm. I feel very fortunate in the time I grew up in, uh, the 70s and 80s were sort of like my formative years in the 90s of when I assimilated the music, which became, you know, part of my identity. And um, not to disparage music of today, I wouldn't dare do that, but there's something about mu music creation from the album era of of pop music which has had a great deal of of exploration and adventurism hmm. um that you know was in, was important to me and 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 my peer group when when we were coming up and i think that kind of adventurism is really um uh i don't know just it, it it feels a little bit unique to a certain generation of musicians and i feel like i am part of it and I'll give you an example. Uh, this is of sorts. Um, one of my favorite film scores you mentioned earlier in, the, in our talk is uh, 20th Century Women, Mike Mills' film. It's a beautiful film. It's one of my favorite films. One of my favorite scores. The director, Mike Mills, and I are good friends. And uh, we've worked on a number of projects together. And he's just a great collaborator. And he's also just sort of an amateur musician. And he loves to kind of create the musical scores with me. So this film, particular film, 20th Century Women, takes place in 1979 in Santa Barbara and it involves a 15 year old boy primarily primarily involves a 15 year old boy and his mother Annette Benning and a number of peripheral characters who are all kind of responsible or sort of involved in his um moment of transition in life 15 in, into uh uh into manhood if you will so that's that's the thumbnail of the of the of the story now it Mike mills the director and i both were 15 in 1979 and so we are able to understand very specifically what music meant to a kid at that time because our our protagonist in this film is kind of like a uh like a punk rock kid who also likes um the talking heads and other bands and, and he was it was like some of the storylines has to do with in some ways the conflict between different political outlooks of different bands um and and the and the sonic differences between different bands and uh and sort of what they stood for now that was all very very meaningful to me and we ended up um the director and i coming up with a sound for the score which um was as if we were writing the movie actually in 1979 we were not trying to make it seem like a backward looking nostalgic film that we we're trying to do everything to make sure it wasn't that so we we're using as if the aesthetic and the instruments from that period of time but trying to make a score that was modern but modern if you were in 1979. so it was a really fun kind of, kind of experiment but the reason i bring this up considering like the generation i brought i i, that I come from is that um an older rather a younger composer who didn't live through those times would not understand the subtleties of um the stranglers versus devo versus talking heads you can look backwards and hear that music but until you like understand like what that really meant in any given summer you know throughout the passage of mm -hmm. historical time you would miss the subtleties of, of that like it would be the same way if i was writing a um a score that was taking place in the, in the 1930s 30s and i was trying to do a big band score you know i would do my best but um <laughs> i hope someone gives me that gig because i'd love to do it but mm -hmm. you know there's things that there were things there'd be things about the differences between different big band artists and sounds which i just wouldn't know because in some ways they're lost to history now mm -hmm. you know because because people who, who grew up with that music are a, you know is a receding group of people so I just feel in many ways the music that I grew up with late seventies in the eighties and early nineties just has been able to, um, to give me a rich, um, rich resources for, for continuing to continuing to invent 
and continuing to come up with with fresh music and um and yeah so it, you know just for me personally compared to music i hear now which is you know the popular music i just feel like there is more variety of what i grew up with and that has served me well i hope i'm wrong in some ways you know i'm, I'm sure i am i'm sure there's younger composers who are growing up now or who are coming into um maturity now who uh and i and i know them young composers who are in this in this field who are you know using their their resources and their their influences to create new music it's great but, but um I know I just feel like I come from a very rich musical background and culture, and, I, and I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for it. Hmm. That's a great point in how when you're hearing the music as it's happening, as it's coming out, you don't have this what's coming after this feeling. Like you don't know that after, you know, the talking heads will come the next movement. Now we're going to go into like a more like a, the the uh, kind of like electro pop thing in the 80s and then the 90s right. are going to bring on hair metal grunge transition and you know like without that perspective it's easy to just kind of see a bunch of different things that happen but to when you you know from what i got to experience from like the 80s into the 90s and then I've, i i kind of feel like it not a lot really transitioned as much after that <laughs> personally but um it was exciting like whoa this is the thing and like you have no idea what's coming next you get that like feeling yeah. of, this whoa is this the new thing you're hearing and that kind of open-mindedness um and excitement like i can really think back to like specific summers that were like yeah it was this kind of thing and then even one year later it's a totally different feeling it's a great perspective to bring to the film and when, and also you don't know what's going to, what's going to be lasting and it doesn't really matter. And, and, uh, what I mean is this, like, uh, so in 1979 reference to this film, talking heads had a couple albums out and they were mostly at that point in time, a guitar band, a kind of a quirky, um, New York artsy guitar band is later on, they've changed to the different sonic worlds, but, it, but that hadn't happened yet in, in, in 1979, they were just one cool brand new band um just like um another band the raincoats is on their on our soundtrack and other bands that were like didn't didn't um transition into giant bands but at the time they're all on the equal playing field because you know you don't you don't know who's going to be big it doesn't really matter it's like at that during that particular moment in time these are the bands that that hipster kids listen to and that's all that matters um you can look backwards if you're backwards looking and say, okay, what was cool in 1979, you might, you might, or any given year, you might make the mistake of just grabbing the bands that you've heard about, you know, say like, like U2, for example, uh, the band U2, um, also big around that time, it already sort of it landed, um, but they weren't the U2 we know today, they were just some cool band mm -hmm. from Ireland, like many other band you might encounter, and they sounded fresh and interesting, and they sounded really hip. Um, you know, later on a band like that then expands their history. And you can look back and say, oh, I, you know, I just love everything they stood for, or, or oh my God, they became terrible or whatever. And that colors our view of it. But at that particular moment in time, it was just like a cool band, like so many that you were excited to know about. Right. You had no idea you two was going to wind up on everyone's iPod. Yeah. <laughs> that one of them. <laughs> or, or, or that like another band, like, I don't know, um, Buzzcocks did not. As much as I love that band, like you just don't know, you know, who's going to be the band that's going right. to make 20 albums. Right. Yeah. You see that in a lot of mus uh, movements where they're kind of things are bubbling, but who knows? And when you look back, kind of knowing it, 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 it colors the way that music sounds, mm -hmm. knowing where they're going to wind up. I've, I've actually had it happen for me for bands where they, the new album kind of changes how I feel about the older albums just it's like oh yeah okay i see it. and sometimes it's better sometimes it's worse but <laughs> when you're at least going through it you can go back to like that's what it was at that time now that i'm older it feels different because of what has happened in, in the intervening time between is there is there an artist that's released something that made you feel less good about their earlier stuff like oh my god they really suck i didn't realize it until now <laughs> I've had uh, experiences where I guess it, it was uh, it made me kind of see it was maybe like 
cheesier than I realized when I was younger. You know what I mean? Like yeah. when you, I think sometimes when you're younger, you you accept that stuff because it's it's like part of your identity. You know what you're sure. going through, and then something comes out and it kind of makes you see yourself in a different way. Mm -hmm. I, I'm sure it's my own self critiques, really, and saying, "Hey, you didn't know anything back then," <laughs> but it shines that light on you. You know, it's interesting. I I found that during um, these last few years during the pandemic, I did a lot of fresh listening. And often I would I would be listening to music from my youth that I'd sort of forgotten about, um, and uh, and that was a fun adventure. Or another thing I found specifically like there might be a, an an artist or band that I love when I was younger, and then I stopped listening to their music at a certain point in time, um, and then going back and then and reacquainting myself with them and following the history when I stopped, like a certain artist where I might, like in 1990, just stop listening to their album that was inter interested in different things, going back and finding out what they did later. Mm -hmm. um, that was a fun journey for me, um, just to sort of like get a more of a bird's eye view on on some of these artists that were so important to me at certain points in my life. Hmm. Yeah, that's it's funny that so much of it is what we bring to the table too, you know, where we are in our lives when it hits you and, um, where you are later on it's kind of one of the nice things i think is when you do go back to that older stuff that you grew up on you on one hand get that feeling that you had but you also have mm -hmm. this kind of uh you know rear view mirror perspective yeah yeah and it could be it can be mixed up right like sometimes i'll listen to older stuff i like when as a kid when i was a kid and i can both i can feel at the same time wow i still love this wow this is really awful I didn't realize. <laughs> I didn't realize how bad it was. I hope no one walks in while I listen to this, but God, I still, it's still uh -huh. freaking great. Um, or occasionally, like, yeah, boy, I thought this album was so great, or this movie. It's more often with movies, I think. Oh, I used to thought this thought this movie was so great, but watching it now, oh boy, it's not that good. So, <laughs> I'm having that feeling fun. actually. Um I I loved the Sopranos when it came out. Mm -hmm. I thought it was great, you know, loved it. And I'm rewatching it again with my wife now. And it's a little, I'm still enjoying it, but I think it's just a little, it has less impact. It's so much TV has come in that kind of genre where, where I think that was a kind of revolutionary show. It was kind of a new thing, the cable TV, mm -hmm. you know, series. Um, it doesn't feel as intense or powerful might just be me might be the times but well I, well I would suspect with that show and it is a great show and i i've also revisited that a bit more recently but you know the time it, when it came out in its own time period it was shocking it was pushing an envelope and um and was and and really opened some doors um in television it was maybe one of the very first true prestige tv series right like like the like opening the door to the fact that TV is so damn good now. We can thank mm. The Sopranos as one of those very important series that brought us there. But the things that made it cutting edge and shocking have since been co-opted by other people and other 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 you know TV series, other other creations. So um, not that shocking, you know. Yeah. You can, you can say that even for like say a series like uh game of thrones the original series that was very shocking when it first came out with its um nudity and it's uh um the, the, particularly i think the way it killed off characters Everybody. main characters <laughs> really surprisingly yeah. Yeah. like that was like that was amazing so you don't even know like well, who, who how did who, you kill ned stark in the first season did, yeah. <laughs> yeah um and that was like no one had done that before yeah and it just it was it kind of unmoored the viewer but in a really interesting way like i don't know where we're going now right <laughs> um and i think before that in many ways one of the comforts of watching the series you liked was sort of revisiting old friends you know i wonder what they're gonna do this week my old buddies there and then king's landing but with a series like that no it's like your old buddies are gone and you have to make associations with with new friends so but that was that was one of the things that that series brought um mm. to us that was that was um unexpected and fresh and crazy and um now that's become kind of a lingua franca you know like a lot of a lot of other shows do that kind of thing so 
looking back on those first excellent first few seasons of um, Game of Thrones, it's um, not quite as cutting edge. Doesn't mm -hmm. feel the same. Still good stuff though. Those first seasons. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I know it got controversial. <laughs> yeah. uh, it you know it reminds me of the music though, actually, because as in you didn't know where the band was going to go and who was going to make it big when you're watching those shows you you know like uh, he's gonna get it soon <laughs> she's not gonna be around much longer <laughs> yeah yeah, yeah. <laughs> you kind of know the fate of this thing so that's it's fair that i guess to you know to consider the surprise factor is it's powerful and the art we consume i think for me also uh, since i've been working in film and television for such a long time that I'm a bit more um, uh, keen, sort of um, on on the signals that a writer and director will give us to know where the plot's going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, I think I have more, a bit more insights than most, just because I kind of like can see the the machinations uh, as an insider. It drives my wife crazy because I will say something like, "Okay, that character right there, or that piece of we just got a piece of." Uh, of dialogue which seems completely unimportant that's going to be important right. uh and that and that means but that means this character's going to die in the third act and she'll like she'll yell at me like shut up i don't want to hear you um but i become i become more aware of like uh um i don't know the signals of uh, uh and um yeah there's, there's important plot moments that, that the writer will, will give us in, in a movie yeah. I'm not always right, though, which is also great because I'm glad when, when I think I know what's going to happen, and uh, and it turns out that the writer is much more clever than I am. Uh -huh. That's reassuring. Yeah, that is nice. Yeah, the the Chekhov's gun, right? Is the, exactly. Uh, if there's a shotgun in Act One on the above the mantle, it better be fired by the end. And it, it's like I guess the principle of um, you know you got to cut out all that extraneous stuff. You can't have all these extra. So knowing that, and you see, like, hmm, that seems like an innocent thing with the baseball falling on the ground and rolling away, but exactly. <laughs> it's gonna be some big symbol or an important tool at the end of the movie. Yeah, why did why did the director pan down for one second on that baseball? That's so unimportant. And you realize, well, probably not unimportant. Probably probably gonna that, that check off baseball. You just wait. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that's funny yeah like uh you know you got me thinking now just a weird connection but um with the um dead follows darby show mm. uh darby and the dead i'm sorry um <clears throat> that it kind of plays off the i see dead people uh plot twist of um the yeah fifth, the fifth sixth sense the sixth, sixth sense, sense. It was mm -hmm. a, a shocker when that happened for me anyway that was one that got you rewatching. but i thought it was kind of cute that they uh throw that in right away you know yeah and in fact uh, yeah in fact the director um of darby and the dead silas howard a good guy good friend of mine and i've worked with him on, on a number of projects so he brought me on board this movie he reached out to me initially and explained it's 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 the sixth sense meets mean girls um <laughs> And I would throw in a bit of clueless in there too, uh, but it does have to do with, um, which is a weird combination. It's a great, it's a great description of it. Six Sense meets Mean Girls. It's like a, you know, it's a high school, it's like a funny black comedy high school caustic drama with with dead people and living people. Um, also, it's the least scary ghost story you're going to see this month um, by by design. It's it's like these mm. the the dead people in our in our movie are are. They're not there to make life bad for uh, living people. They're just trying to move on into um, being dead. They're sympathetic so it, characters, yeah. Yeah, they are, and it's that. That's also a fun twist because, you know, like there's so many tropes you get used to on a certain type of movie. If you're going to watch a ghost movie, you, there's certain things that you expect, and it's a lot of fun when those expectations are um, turned upside down. And mm. that, that's always you know, makes things a bit more spicy. Hmm. So I imagine a big part of that feeling comes from the sound, right? The music <laughs> and, and the score and everything. Um, God, I hope so. <laughs> well, from I, I think so. <laughs> I'm curious how um, your approach might have been to communicate that and 
um especially yeah like you said when you de- and it didn't occur to me but the dead people are like almost like cuddly pets half the time <laughs> if yeah. only characters um how do you approach that to communicate that because i'm sure you know a couple different notes here a couple different <laughs> chord changes and you've got a much different feeling well there's a whole journey about that movie with the score to that which i think is pretty pretty um illustrative of um the process of trying to find the sound that, that fits the movie because because we had a f- couple of false starts it also um this harkens back to what I said earlier about as a composer having the ability to do different things because you might have to change course and change write one kind of music and have it and then write a different kind of music altogether. And that was the case with Dryer Being the Dead. And here's what happened specifically. So it's a movie about um, our protagonist, Darby, living person, who has this ability to um, to communicate with recently dead people and she helps them transition into um, the great beyond. And the, and the people who are the ghosts in this in her world are mostly like her friends or people she's helping not her friends but people she's helping out and she becomes well known among the um, let's say ghost community as someone who can be kind of like a um, ghost therapist and help them on their journey. So that's that's the main premise. And um, early in the movie, we are introduced to her fr- frenemy, <laughs> Capri who um, conveniently for the story conveniently becomes dead. Um, not in a scary way, but just dies. And and so Capri, her friend and me becomes um, a ghost and they um, are, at, are at loggerheads against each other until they kind of unite in friendship to a common goal. And then and then that doesn't work out and more tension happens. Okay, so that's that's a sort of a description of the movie without without betraying any important plot points. Now, when I first started writing the music with uh, and having discussions with the filmmakers in the studio about what the music should sound like, we all liked the idea of a very colorful score that was going to sort of enhance the magical and supernatural aspect of the story. Um, Not exactly like, but sort of in the same world as Harry Potter, let's say. Just, you know, like sort of um, fun supernatural um flourishes um and uh creating that other world of uh of dead people and that would that seemed like the, what this movie was so i went down that path and spent about mm. probably two months maybe six weeks writing music that was very orchestral and very um fun ghost like if you will and it was Pop good and we all <laughs> yeah, but, but put that on my single fun ghost music. Um, and it was successful. It worked. It worked well. But then we just all realized and by we, I mean, the, the filmmakers and the studio and I didn't quite feel right for this story. After all, this is the this is the music we thought would work. Then we then I created it. And it turned out the music really wasn't about ghosts. After all, it was like a, this is a discovery you all made us really it wasn't about ghosts. It was about um, the dramas of of being in high school and the transition from uh being um a child into adulthood and in some ways the whole notion of dying in this film was a metaphor if you will into into in dying and moving down to the afterlife it's a metaphor into becoming an adult um and that was a story that needed to be told not the supernatural story it was the the emotional high school angsty drama of, of of transitioning into, into adulthood that was a story that needed to be told the ghost part, part was taking care of itself the music did not have to do it so we had to reconceptualize the entire score from top to bottom and come up with a whole different sound and that was a challenge that was a real challenge because it you know after working for weeks and weeks and weeks and writing really good music um then you have to adjust the uh, course of the ocean liner uh that's not necessarily the easiest thing to do um because you think like what if i just turn it this way a little bit no it's not turning enough gotta turn it more turn it more until finally we just realized gosh we need to just completely make a whole different sound so we ended up doing this we kept we kept a lot of the music that i had composed but 
but um, radically re reorchestrated it, taking out the, all the orchestral elements, every single orchestral element out of it, and reimagining it with um, a bunch of quirky instruments that I recorded in my studio, a bunch of hip hop elements and rock elements, and just crazy sort of hybrid sounds, and um, made it in some ways a smaller sounding score, but a more unique and weird sounding musical score. Um, until we finally, when we finished it all up, and I finished the score, ended up being something really, I think, unusual. And, and also, I think, hopefully, um, way more appropriate for this story and for this, these characters. It's got a fun feeling. It, it conveys that, that, um, not, I, I can only imagine like a, maybe more orchestral would feel a little more serious that has, um, yeah. It, all, it also started to feel, this is um, the or more orchestral approach made it also sound a little dated, and that wasn't good. Um, oddly, this was about, I think, maybe the fifth movie I had scored in the last few years that was um, like teenage-oriented, um, high school-oriented, one being unpregnant for HBO by two high school girls on a road trip. Um, Three months, another film I did for MTV Films uh, the previous year about a um, high school kid um, who was, uh, possibly has HIV, a comedy. Um, so I, I've been like kind of in the, in the world of like how to, how to tell stories of, of, this, of this time period uh, in, in, in a person's life. And so I felt like I had some experience, um, but I didn't, um, with, with the orchestral sound that I, I had was toying with with Darby. It it ultimately felt like it just wasn't the right sound, and also it just like it didn't didn't sound as fresh. You know, mm. it was good. I kept a lot of the music, um, or I don't know, used another day, which I'm sure there will never will be one. But just I like it, but it just wasn't quite right for this storyline. Mm. Does that happen often, where you have to sort of, I mean, look, two months of work. That's. Um, oh. does that, how does that feel when you have to really face the face the music so to speak and it hurts yeah it hurts um because for any given any given piece of music um well first of all it's not uncommon for a composer who's scoring a movie to write way more music than is actually used you know if there's a movie that you watch and there's 60 minutes of music in a two-hour movie it's likely that the composer has written three or four hours of music um, on their journey to find the sounds that are going to work, to find the voice that's going to work. That's not necessarily uncommon. But um, this this score was was very, very complex. So any, any music that I wrote, uh, particularly the earlier orchestral stuff, not only had to be composed and, um, and vetted by the filmmakers, but then also would have to be orchestrated and score prepped for an orchestra to perform and recording studio to be set up, which we all had that in place. We had a whole, we we're going to record it uh, at Abbey Road in London. We was all set to go. So it's like, it wasn't simply a matter of I'll write something else. Like it's like, like, it's like I have to build another house and to build another house, you have to like order the concrete and make the plans and start, you know, um, hiring people. And, and like, there's so much more involved than just simply writing it. Um, so when I had to, when I had to change plans when I had to tear down the house and come up with a whole different plan, it was, it was nerve wracking. I mean, it was, um, it was difficult. It was really difficult. Um, but fun, but still difficult, very much a challenge. One of those kind of projects that, um, where you go <laughs> weeks and weeks without really, you know, bathing or changing your clothes all that much. You're just like working, 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 trying to get it right. Right. Did you ever hit a point where you weren't sure if it was going to work? Good question. Um, I think I've just been a, I've scored enough movies to know eventually we'd get it. I'd get it right. Mm -hmm. Um, but you do reach a point of exhaustion <laughs> certain nights where you're like, God damn, I just gladly at this point give back every penny they paid me just to just 
have a good night's <laughs> sleep, you know. <laughs> but you know, then you get your second wind, your fourteenth wind, and you get back to it. Um, it's not always like this, and generally it isn't, but sometimes it is, and that's okay. And that's that sometimes it just takes what it takes to 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 get the job done um, effectively. There are other films or projects where I feel very sure-footed from the get-go. I know exactly what it's going to sound like. I'll write, uh, and it's been there's been those films where I've written a piece of music and and the director likes it, and I said, yeah, when I first saw this movie two months ago and you showed it to me, this is this is what I had in my mind immediately, and here it is, and this is just exactly right. Um, that's fun, you know, to be that sure-footed. This it's every project is different. Sometimes it's more ex exploration than not. Um, it does take a while though, uh, in, in the process for a composer to find the right sound. And I'm, I'm sure this is not unique to just music composition is true for any creative work. Um, they get hired to score a film. It's not like, okay, I'm going to start writing today. And this is, you know, here's page one. Um, it requires, uh, usually a lot of exploration, a lot of trying things out, um, to get it right, you know, to find the right, the right combination of elements. Mm. Yeah, I think that's kind of true too, even in songwriting, where you kind of need to find the, the attitude or the, um, the sound palette, or just the, just the general theme, even the kind of world you're going to put the theme in is, mm -hmm. it can be challenging I, i've i've been there myself many a times where i feel like i have a, a fun idea cool idea but i'm just not getting the sort of uh you know the curtains right the uh what kind of house <laughs> it's even gonna be you know and then once in a while you just kind of you get there um but uh my my approach is similar to yours in that it's just like just keep pushing and um I try to see that um, th those challenges and those obstacles is just like inevitable things that come up. And when I'm good in my mental state, I try to remind myself that's part of what makes this fun and exciting is that it is hard. If it was mm -hmm. super easy, it would, you know, if, you, if it was the easiest thing in the world to do, there's a lot less, um, you know, I guess triumph at the end. Yeah. And if anybody tells you it's effortless, they're lying to you. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't had anyone say that, believe it or not. <laughs> I take comfort that I'm not the only one in misery sometimes. <laughs> well, you know, I think a lot of um creative people feel that it might be I don't know, advantageous to to create the impression that this that the work just comes from nowhere and just lands and it's beautiful and just explodes out of your loudspeaker or onto your screen fully formed. But, um, it's as if it's, if it's, if it's more pure, if it, if it doesn't require effort, I don't, I don't know, but certainly it's not the case. And a lot of, a lot of us will go to great efforts, I think, to, um, to hide how much effort it took, uh, to do what we do. Uh, right now I'm thinking of an example of classical composers. Mozart is famously, um, there's a mythology about him, you know, like how we just like would have it all worked out in his head and uh, just write things down. And he didn't, there was no notes of his music because everything just went right onto the page and it was perfect from the get go. And the, the movie Amadeus has it, it sort of helped perpetuate that mythology. It's not true. Um, he just burned his notes. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Beethoven did not burn his notes. We have them. We have the notes that Beethoven took. We could see the 16 different times it, it took for him to perfect a theme for, for a symphony um, until he got it right. Um, and I love that about his music, about Beethoven. You see, you hear the struggle in his music. In Mozart, you you don't hear a struggle. It's, it's, it seems like it's so beautifully formed, but there was a struggle. He, he just mm -hmm. pretended there wasn't. And, you know, there's been many more modern examples you, you can come up with of people who, you know, it just seems like it's so effortless. And I think I know, somehow I think we just like to feel like it is, um, but it's not. It takes a lot of work. 
It takes a lot of work to get this stuff done. It's a romantic thought. This yeah. is like kind of inspired artist, um, you know, just kind of like touched by the the hand of some greater power. <laughs> <laughs> For me, growing up, I, I you know, I, I didn't. I was actually in fourth grade as well, and it was time to hand out the band instruments, and I wanted the drums, and I got assigned the flute, and I didn't Ow. want to play it because. I think really all the girls were playing the flute. <laughs> so I didn't want to be the only boy. Which in hindsight would have been the better choice. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Silly me. You know, <laughs> 2020 is, uh, you know, rear view of mirrors, 2020, whatever that expression is. But um, so I never, I didn't have that until I picked up a guitar at about 14. And up until that point, all my favorite musicians and artists, they were struck by lightning on the mountaintop and gifted with these powerful songs and it was a mystery to me but um it's it's i guess only just trying to do it yourself that you actually see it for what it really is and once in a while it comes together a little bit easier than other times and mm -hmm. you can almost understand where that mythology comes from but it's uh no, it's never easy. And sometimes even as much as I love doing it, sometimes the thought of getting started is almost terrifying because you know you're going into this great abyss of the unknown. Yeah, you know, I, I it is interesting when we're younger, we look on on the artists we like as, as somewhat godlike. You know, these great songwriters, these great artists. Um, Fortunately, in, in my life, I've been able to meet many of the uh, of the artists who I, you know, who were gods to me earlier on, and then I think mm. happened to work with them and, and get to know some of them. And you realize, um, it can, you come to realize a few things as 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 the process becomes demystified, the process of creation. Um, a couple things I've learned just from working with 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 artists that I've that I, I revered is. Uh, um, a lot of them just do one thing, but they do it really, really well. And it's not—it's not a knock against them. It's just it, it, in my in my world, in my education, I, I you know have all these disparate, really wild influences and training. I, um, you mentioned earlier, I have a PhD from Harvard. Overkill. Don't do this, boys and girls. Um, but I I enjoy doing it. It was just something that kind of came naturally, but not not crucial at all to be an artist and to have, have like that kind of you know academic background. And so some of the some of the rock musicians the pop musicians who i've worked with they realize oh they just do one thing but they just do it so damn well they take in this one little area of talent that they have and just just done something fabulous with it and that's why they're great they, they don't know how to do everything they can only really do that one thing but damn it's good so that's one thing i learned in the, in the demystification process it's been helpful to understand that another thing is also um a lot of the stuff that we love as great music starts out bad you know it does not it doesn't come out fully formed hmm. as being good and, I, and and right now i'm thinking specifically about the wonderful um get back documentary that hmm. peter jackson gave us last year so good yeah, i really yeah. enjoyed this so much i loved it and you see yeah. those guys the beatles just messing around the studio, studio like kicking around a song idea and sometimes, like pretty early on, you don't these songs don't sound any better than anybody else's songs. Mm -hmm. You know, they just they just don't. They they sound they sound fine, but later on, they just they just like they they work it, they workshop it, they get it sounding right, they record it with the you know with these great um, engineers, and um, and eventually it becomes you know the priceless music that we love. But but the, but when they first comes out, it just sounds just just okay, okay, mm -hmm. you know. Um, and to me, that was very, it was very um, inspiring in a way. It's like it, it, all it takes is well, it takes not just genius, but also a lot of hard work and 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 faith. I think and the other thing that that get back documentary showed us is that these guys got around, like knew it would eventually is going to be really good. Mm -hmm. So they had the faith just to keep like you know trying to make it sound good, rehearsing the song over and over again, try tweaking this, tweaking that, because they know because they knew from their own personal history that it's going to come out pretty damn good eventually as long as he kept working at it mm. yeah there's something i guess about that experience that creates a trust 
in themselves. We've we've been here. We've done this before, and we、mm-hmm. we just got to stay the course. It was, yeah, it was beautiful to watch some of those songs come to life. And again, we know the outcome, right? So we know what's、yeah. going to happen, but they don't. And, and exactly wrestling with it, and you see at. The same time that they're regular people, you know, just going through the sludge like everyone else, and they're also the the geniuses that they are, and you're watching these like two sides come together.、Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that was. I mean, I love that kind of stuff. I, even when the anthologies came out, like I can see, it's been a long time now, but. All those outtakes, just to hear where they started, and some、yeah. rough demos that sound almost like the ones that I was making on my four track, in a way. Oh, right, right. You know? <laughs> But then it turned into, you know, the masterpieces that they are. One thing that really struck out there's so many things about the Get Back documentary that I just found inspiring. But one thing was、um, uh, Peter Jackson, the director, had, was showing the, a visual of a calendar. Like they're going to start on this date, and they have、mm-hmm. to they have put this date or down here as the as the date they're going to release this music. And first, the idea was going to be it was going to be a concert, and it was only about three weeks between the first day they got together. They had not been together in quite a few months because、um, they were all doing other stuff, and they're going to start like you know first week of January, I think, and then they were going to three three weeks later they're going to be done. Okay, so. Not only are you going to are you going to start from zero and write a whole album in three weeks, <laughs> you're going to write a Beatles album in three weeks. I mean, can you imagine? <laughs> But that's how they did it. Those guys. That's how they were so productive. It's just like we're just going to kick this out and make it. You know, just the best music in the world, and we're going to take three weeks to do it, and then we're going to and it's going to be done.、Mm-hmm. Uh, they did take an extra couple two weeks, I think, for, ultimately. But still, not that long to to make this record. And admittedly, not their best record、uh, by any any measure, but still, you know, priceless. Still, like you know, a great Beatles record. Yeah, would be many great bands' finest album if it was theirs. <laughs> for certain, for certain. <laughs> and you see them really kind of crash at one point, you know, a couple points even with the, like their location, and then also George leaves, and they they hit like a rock bottom of sorts. Um. I, I imagine for you, you must be in a similar situation in that you're dealing with like pretty tough deadlines, and it's you know like the Beatles. There was it wasn't just three other people that were kind of banking on them to finish this. It was a whole team of people.、Uh, and for you,、um, how does that pressure work for or against you when you have? I'm assuming you have probably pretty strict deadlines like. Uh, Roger,、uh, we kind of need the music by now because we're trying to. <laughs> we can't move forward without it. Well, I'll tell you. I mean, yes, yes, I do, and that also is is one very important reason why I chose this particular field of music, which is the deadlines. Because if when I don't have deadlines, I am the laziest person in America. Like I just <laughs> noodle around. <laughs> you know, I'm going to start writing when I learn this new software.、Uh, So I'll just wait, talk, you know, spend three weeks doing that, and then、eh, I don't know. Now I learned that I'm going to learn different stuff. I, mean, I just anything I can do to like not work,、mm-hmm. count, you know, count me in. I'm going to do that. So,、um, so I love the deadlines. I love the deadlines, and I love the short ones too.、Uh, you know, I we've been talking about my my movie work, but I started out in this industry mostly as a television composer. And that was really, really important to my、uh, personal formation because I just love the idea of it, you have to write this and it's due on Thursday, as opposed to, you know, yeah,、right. sometime next year turn in your symphony. It's like no,、um, do one Thursday. And so that's you know, there's a it, it focuses you. It in some ways reduces expectations because you're not going to reinvent the world between now and Thursday. You're just going to come up with the best you can under those constraints. So, I love that. I love like just being able to、um, to use the first idea, hone it, make it as good as possible. It works great, and I, you know, 
turn it in. Let's let's you know, what's next. Let's move on to the next episode. You know that 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 I really very much enjoy having the deadlines because again, with without it, I just flounder. I just kind of mess around. Uh, you, you're, you you can see that in, in my studio you're, you're behind me visually. There's all these instruments, and you know I can just I can just spend all my time just like noodling around and, and not working. But I do need I do need a gun to my head, and I just know that's true about me. Well, for anyone that's only listening, I can see a good half a dozen guitars, maybe a bass <laughs> too. I see a Hofner, Paul McCartney style bass. Yeah, uh, looks like some kind of synthesizer. Maybe is that like a Moog Minotaur? Oh, yeah, oh, good for you. Like yes, that. it's actually it's it's um it is a minotaur, but it's a special one called the, the Siren. That it's a minotaur hybrid, right? And, right. You know, just, and there's a bunch of really crazy instruments, including a Turkish oud over my shoulder. Yeah. I, I got all these all this stuff. So you got a lot of toys studio. to just <laughs> a lot of good excuses to just play around. Yeah. Well, you mentioned lowering expectations. How does that factor in? Do you find that that frees you up in any kind of way? creatively oh, yes yes um you know i can think i think this is very much a common um mindset for people in the creative world or any world but i think about say the say the film composers that i love the ones that i find really inspiring and just like oh I, um i just love their work and i you know they're, they're giants in the industry and um how did they come up with this that unique sound? How did they come up with those beautiful things that they create? You know, whether it's um, Thomas Newman or John Williams or um, Trent Reznor or any number of people I can think of. And I could spend, like if I was asked, like, oh, you know, we want you to, Roger, we want you to score a movie in the style of a 1970s John Williams. I'd be like, oh, wow, that's quite a task. That's going to take forever. Um, but, but I love to do it. But usually... Hmm, how can, I, how can I say this? Um, it just becomes a nice um, freedom when you don't have to rise to that level and you can simply just write whatever you think is going to work at that time. It's better than trying to like reach for the stars every single time. And, and, and I say that not not to um, advocate copying out and lowering your standards, because I'm pretty sure John Williams and Thomas Newman feel the same way about their own work. You know, like, I, I, I'm only getting like, he might say, Tommy, I only have so much time to write this, this score to 1917. I'm just going to do what I do uh, and make it as good as possible. Um, I'm not going to recreate the world. I'm just going to do what I do. And then it usually comes out great because you only have so much time. Hmm. And I love that. And and again, going back to the our Beatles um, conversation a few minutes ago, like the same for them. Like setting those deadlines was just I was just really astonished because I thought I just kind of had this idea of them just like hanging around forever until the news hits and then working it until it was absolutely perfect. No, they had deadlines. They had contractual deadlines, mm -hmm. not imaginary ones. Like they had to deliver the record at a certain time. Um, they had guns to their heads, proverbially speaking, same way that I do. Um, I just think that is helpful. Um, as an artist, I'll tell you this in one and one last point to illustrate this. So we talked earlier about the fact that I am a, I went to Harvard, I have a PhD in music composition from Harvard. And for a PhD, one has to require one has to um, your final thing you do is is you deliver your dissertation. Uh, and in a PhD in composition that usually is a large scale um, composition. Um, the dissertation in any field can really be like the thing that kills a graduate student, like they can spend, you can just get lost in dissertation land, spending virtually years writing that thing. Um, because it's supposed to represent your announcement to the world that here, to the, to, to the academic scholarly world, here's what I stand for. Here's who I am. That's a tall order, hmm. you know, and for most people, many people, it's too tall of an order to like say, here's the entirety of everything that I know how to do and everything the and my breadth of knowledge is in this thing I'm going to give you. Here it is. Boom. It's just, it, it's too much. And so when I labored for a couple of years on my dissertation, I think it was two years, which is not that long, but still, um, 
it was just I, I could see colleagues like graduate student colleagues of mine who were just kind of lost in this morass. They just like of like trying to get this work done so they can move on with their lives. And 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 I could understand like how long it takes to, to do to do this kind of work. So fortunately, in my case, I artificially put a gun to my head. I I started when I was a graduate student. I actually um, left graduate school before I finished my work. Got jo a job working in the TV music world and was working professionally and as happy as a clam on that new new path. Still had not finished my my final work for my um, for graduate school, and then I just took one summer off and just wrote everything I needed to write and turned it in and it was fine. It was perfectly good. So, um, like having the ability to just having the, the license to just turn something in that's that, um, didn't have to represent everything I could do just was like a nice piece of music, which was very good. Um, that was the decision I made. It just taught me like what, what I needed to in my life to make my work work, which is to, um, have those deadlines have um uh an understanding of just like you're going to start here and end here and be done mm. and then the other thing actually also is super crucial which i just i found that was great for me is in in television and film music is having collaborators that helps too because otherwise like you film composers and maybe you're the same i mean i'm stuck in the studio you're looking at my studio i'm stuck in the studio day after day after day working and sometimes do not venture into the outside world and it's wonderful to have people I'm working with say, yeah, uh, go back, do it again. You're not done. Or this one's done, move on. Or the, this one's almost right. Here's some ideas. Try this. I like that. I like that a lot. Mm -hmm. Um, it can be hard, very difficult to know yourself when you are done or when you're not done. So having collaborators is something that I find very, very comforting in, in my profession. Mm, sometimes it's even just one sentence. <laughs> <laughs> I can't understand the vocals. Oh, <laughs> that's important. <laughs> now I know what to do. Yeah. Oh yeah. I and mean, then that's a five minute fix, right? Yeah. As opposed to like spending the next two weeks rewriting the song. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. That's amazing how that works, but I can understand how that could be, especially something like that, but it must've been, um, like your dissertation, I mean, but it must've been or was it helpful that you were getting work you were already doing stuff so you were kind of i guess in a way already start, you said the other guy was waiting to start his life you were you were starting your life so yeah did you, were you at a point where if you didn't finish it it was it would have been okay no <laughs> no um i'll answer this way when i started working professionally let's say in my late 20s one thing i really realized is despite all my years of education i was in college for nine years basically between you know undergraduate and graduate degrees um I look back in the time period is not people ask me how, how much how much did that academic work uh influence you as a composer and and i said like a lot less than you might think because i kind of realized when i started working professionally that i knew almost everything i needed to do almost i needed i knew i had i knew almost all the skills i needed when i was 17. i just didn't realize it hmm. and all the other academic pursuits and other pursuits was in many ways simply a way of of emboldening myself hmm. you know building my self-confidence it was important to me to not feel like i was a hack like i really wanted to have a depth to um to my talent repertoire um but looking back at my training a lot of it was i could say at this point simply stuff i did for a time which was cool as hell um, and I enjoyed it, but not necessarily a path to where I am now, which is something I did for a while that I do something else, but specifically to your question, if I just not done a dis dissertation, I think that would have been always like an open gaping wound in many ways. It would have been exactly, exactly counterproductive to what I was trying to accomplish, which was that sense of, um, confidence and competence, hmm. you know, if I was going through life, like knowing I never did quite finish that thing that would have hurt i think that would have something that would have been something that, that um 
that haunted me. And boy, like now that you actually mentioned it, I think it actually was in hindsight, very crucial to my work that I did finish it. You know, that no matter what, if I'm doing Darby and the Dead, and after we write the whole score from top to bottom, I can do it because I wrote that goddamn dissertation. That was harder. I could do this. Hmm. Okay. So that was like, you did this really hard thing. It makes everything <laughs> else a little easier. <laughs> yeah. Indeed. Okay. That's cool. That, I, that's a great point about, I guess, any kind of hard work really is how it kind of, I guess, what it doesn't kill you, it makes you stronger type of thing. It, if you know if you've been through something really hard it does sort of ease the blow of a lot of other things that come your way yeah it does, it does. i love king of the hill uh, it's a great show um uh, mike judge is awesome for so many yeah. reasons for being both incredibly stupid and smart at the same time yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's brilliant uh, I wanted to ask you what your role was on on that show. Yeah, that was um, a great show, and um, people still love it. You know, I think we made our last episode uh, fifteen years ago, maybe ten years ago. I don't remember. It's been a while. It's still on. It's still on TV. TV is that even a thing? Uh, well, it's, it's still it's out streaming. there. You can watch it. Uh, yeah, because <laughs> it's, it's one of those shows my wife will put on. To just have something on, you know, for yeah, a little yeah. bit of time. I put on King of the Hill, but it's, you know, so The Office was another one, but I don't know yeah. if you can get that anymore. So it's up there in like some of the great shows. Yeah, it still speaks to people. And I, I really love the show and I think it's so beautifully well written. Um, I think that's also a reason why it is really, really um, has had legs because just the, the, the characters are really interesting. The storylines are really interesting. Um, now, it was, it was, one of my first, my very first professional jobs, um, King of the Hill. And, um, yeah, it's fun. I, I, I just happened to know somebody who was an executive at 20th Century Fox Television who was a friend of mine who told me about the show. And, I, and somehow I managed to, as was being developed was in, the, in the, gosh, mid 90s, late 90s, I think. Mm. And my friend Carol sent me a um, a little like five minute uh, video of what's called a pencil test, which is an animation just in, in with pencil, just like no color, just like a basic idea of what the character is going to look like. And I got that, and I thought this this is going this is going to be cool. Let me try to try to find some way to get on this show. Mm -hmm. Now, um, Mike Judge was already well known for Beavis and Butthead, which was cool. And um, he, Mike created the show, King of the Hill, with Greg Daniels, the two of them did it together. So there was some buzz, you know, that people knew this might be really, really good. And there was a lot of composers who were competing to get on this series. I mean, competing, like, you know, trying to throw in their hat. And um, including friends of mine, the people, you know, who I respect very much. And for me, this I, I i somehow lucked into the secret to how to make this show work now for any listeners who are unfamiliar with the show it's an animated series about a family sort of middle class family in austin texas actually it's called um arlen texas in our in our world but it's based on austin and um kind of conservative and quirky and 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 fun with colorful characters who are all the friends of this one family the hill family um the mistake there was a mistake that some of my composer colleagues made when they were trying to demo and get on the on the show which is they they wrote music which was either country or sort of hillbilly-ish in some ways making fun of the texas milieu that this the show was was based on and when i present when i conceptualized the music and presented my take on it it wasn't that it was much more if you will, taking, taking the characters, um, seriously and letting the, letting the, letting the, the quirkiness and the comedy speak for itself. The music for King of the Hill throughout the entire run for the most part was not funny music. It might have been fun. This is the, this is the formula I came up with fun music, not funny music, funny music almost never works. Fun music gives you the, um, the permission 
to laugh. So the, the key was to write fun music and also to write music for these animated characters that had real heart. Um, that is what made that show work well because the, you know, despite the somewhat funny and sometimes crazy storylines, ultimately these are real characters that you cared about. And as a composer, the winning formula was to, was to score it as if these are in fact real people that we care about, not, not to make fun of them. And, uh, that's how I got the gig. Hmm. That's a very interesting distinction because it is a funny show and they mm -hmm. are funny characters <laughs> <laughs> and they are silly and over the top at times, but you do feel like seriously about it. They, they take themselves seriously. Mm -hmm. They're not mm -hmm. aware of that, I guess. And, um, to have the music reflect that and f it is very fun music, lots of great guitar riffs and i've learned them on the guitar myself you know, just because they're just so fun yeah that was also so sonically that the the secret sauce of that show was that we recorded it with a live orchestra which is awesome um but it'd be um like a string orchestra with a few woodwinds and then one or two electric guitars mixed in and we record that all live um at 20th century fox the famous newman scoring stage so that was the sound of the show was the string orchestra string orchestra with like twangy texas guitars uh and it just really worked i and I, I myself am a guitarist as you can see from all the stuff behind me but for that show um i didn't play guitar i used uh um a great session guitarist john goo g-o-u-x who was one of the best ever um and he played the guitar work that I would write and he and I came up with sort of a shorthand on how I would notate um the guitar licks in a way that was very idiomatic because I know how to play guitar but I just don't play it as well as he does mm -hmm. so he would be able to I would be able to present to him like a notated annotated idea of what the guitar should sound like and he would he would run with it and make it sound great and we do it super quick you know it's like you're on a scoring stage you have to get the stuff done immediately and it was just it, be it became the secret sauce and 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 just like a, a fun beautiful way to make music hmm. definitely captures the vibe of the show or creates the vibe i guess in a lot of ways too i just came back last night by the way um from holiday i was out in, in utah at a uh, yoga and hiking resort super fun came back hmm. last night new year's day at this place uh, i'll give it a shout out the red mountain resort uh we were there um, and there's this live band playing, you know, on New Year's Day brunch. And for no particular reason, the band all of a sudden broke into the theme to King of the Hill, which is really fun. And I was able to walk up to him and said, yeah, yeah that's my show. That's <laughs> so, so that was cool. fun. <laughs> it's a great theme. It really is just super fun guitar to play, guitar slinger, like, uh, mm -hmm. you know, really cool stuff. I love it. Um. Let me see here. So I wanted to just maybe ask you one thing because it was kind of thrown in here in the email I got um, about like in in Darby, I think it is, um, some of these uh, found sounds and unusual instruments that mm -hmm. take that show up in the show. And um, I, th I guess I'm really into that kind of stuff. Like what I do a lot of is a lot of sound design and create instruments out of samples that... Um, I just like, and it's a Beatles thing, really. I just loved how they were able to use things that weren't necessarily instruments and turn them into instruments. And once I discovered sampling and all that, I got a real kick out of it. But I'm curious, mm -hmm. uh, what were some of the those things that made their way into some of the, if it was Darby, I'm not sure if that's specifically stated. No, it definitely was. Uh, I actually like recording instruments that I don't play well. <laughs> uh it's 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 it can be really fun like for example i i uh um i'll play violin on some of my scores and i do not play violin at all but i know how to i know how to make a sound come out of it you know put the bow on it and you, you might scrape scrape something across and and i'll come up with with Hmm. sonic results from that violin which no competent player could ever do because i'm so bad that so the sound that comes out of my violin playing is just like it's a crazy special sound that no one else can do um i love doing that kind of stuff hmm. 
you know, with Darby and the Dead, for example, one thing, one one of the key elements was a uh, dulcimer, uh, mountain dulcimer, which is a string instrument, bowed with a with a violin bow, doing tremolo effects and other kinds of things. It's just an interesting sound that there was nothing about the score, the story, or the location that screamed out bowed dulcimer, but it was just a fresh sound. It seemed seemed to kind of fit into that you know supernatural world that that seemed to work for the sound. Um, that combined with like some crazy 808 hip hop um, sounds and drum beats that were like definitely from the hip hop world, but then mixed in with other sounds ended up not being from this world or that world. It was its own, it was, it, it combined together to make its own special stew. So like, like that was another thing. And just like some really strange um, uh, blips and bleeps from my synthesizers that are unusual, just like things that I just came up with on the spot. And again, like sometimes the things like, I don't even know how I did that is twirled some knobs and like this crazy sound came out. That's our sound right there. Um, and being able to, to do that, have the sort of the sure footed confidence to know that this, this weird sound, I can make this work. Um, so that in some ways illustrates the, the process, the exploration process to come up with it, with a sound palette that, uh, that might work for for our you know for the project at hand and especially so i'm using these these weird thing, things like the hat like the the bow dulcimer and the 808 hip-hop sound and then this and that and i'm replacing um sounds that were orchestral in some of these cues like i we kept the music we just replaced all the sounds to like the most weird instruments so it could be a rickenbacker bass playing what used to be a whole string orchestra but now it's just a bass but it worked you know, hmm. it, it really worked. Um, that was <laughs> that was quite. It was. It, it took it took a lot of exploration to find out. You know, with the combination of sounds that would work. Hmm. You know, that has a kind of high school feeling to it. The exploring sound, playing instruments you don't really know how to play, and <laughs> yeah, you know, getting fun new sounds in unusual ways. I think it lends it to that kind of age when you're. You know, like like the characters in the movie. Yeah, yeah, just uh, it seemed to work. It seemed to work. Um, and and boy, I'm I'm grateful to my collaborators, the the studio, uh, 20th Century, and um, Silas and other people, to sort of go on this journey with me. Because what would happen is, is this is this is why in some ways why it's so nerve wracking. I'd write, I'd write a couple of new cues each day and send it in, you know, for, um, for vetting. And I get notes back from everybody, you know, be like, mm -hmm. not just the director, but the head of the studio, mm -hmm. uh, and the head of the motion picture arm of the studio, like everyone's giving me notes, which can be, wow. Like, you know, what, um, what a head spinning thing to try to, you know, respond to everybody's idea of what the score should sound like. Um, you know, you work all night long trying to come up with this new cue and you send it in at three o'clock in the morning and you wake up at, you know, seven the next morning and you got two, two pages of notes on how, you know, what you should do with it. It's like, ah, <laughs> but what makes that process work is that understanding that um, we're all in it together, that the notes that are coming back to me, the observations coming back to me um, are all good. You know, it's everyone responding to, um, here's the music of listening to, yeah, this is working, but here's some ideas to make it better, or here's here's what's not working. Um, you have to trust, you know, the, your collaborators, you have to trust people who are, who are um, chiming in and understand that they're, you know, every idea that come back, comes back is valid and you have to find some way to, uh, to co-op them and, and, and make it into, you know, and make the score better and better each time. It's, it's particularly um, interesting when, when discussing music with people who aren't musicians, um, which is often the case for film composers, always the case with film composers, um, is finding a way to, to talk about musical elements with people who aren't musicians in a manner where they have, your collaborators have a format where they can convey, idea, can, can convey ideas to you in a way that's meaningful and have you be able to interpret that in a way that's musically meaningful. Mm. That's a tough order. Mm -hmm. Yeah. There must be a lot of translation that goes on in your head. 
It is, but it's also part of the job. It's a big part of the job. Um, being able to, if you if you will, sort of invite people in to um, find some way that they can speak to to the composer in a way that um, is understood. Mm -hmm. um, and understandably, a lot of people who aren't musicians, you know, people who might might be my collaborators, my producers, my director, whoever, understandably, they might be reluctant to. I mean, to 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 chime in. I think every single job I've ever had, ever, the first meeting, there's someone chimes in with, "I don't anything. I don't know anything about music. I have nothing to say," and it's my job as a composer to find a common language hmm. that invites people to comfortably come up with ideas and be able to present them to me in a way that's meaningful. Hmm. I often really like the perspective of people that are not musicians on my music. Because they sometimes just see the bigger picture or they just pick up on something that maybe a fellow musician is a little, they're, even though they're not working on that actual piece of music, they're a little too close to music making to yeah. pick up on, you know? And uh, yeah, I mean, the, the one I would get often is, I can't understand what you're saying. And I, <laughs> you know, a, a fellow producer would be like, you know, what if you tried uh, EQing the voice here and, uh, you know, all these technical things, but sometimes you just need to hear, it's not loud enough. Just turn that down. <laughs> yeah, it's, I'll tell you. If, you. if you find yourself in a discussion with somebody as to why... Um, what you're doing is correct you've already lost because you have to explain if you have to explain the music for it to be understood mm -hmm. that shouldn't be required it should be discernible from the outset right. um now in your case maybe there's some reason that you are trying to make <laughs> the vocals hard to understand i don't know sometimes that's a choice yeah sometimes that's a choice like I'm um, afraid I didn't sing too well this time. <laughs> <laughs> well, sometimes that a lot. You know, I don't know. I mean, it might be more more significant than that. I and mean, sometimes you yeah. want your listeners to lean in. Right. Wait, what is he? I can't quite hear the lyrics. Or I can't quite, quite hear the voice. I'm gonna really sharpen my ear and trying to get in there. And then that might be I end up being a the right creative choice. You know, mm -hmm. to um to make your to encourage your listeners to kind of like zero in more. Uh, on on what you're trying to say, in my opinion, that's a thing. That could be that could be exactly what you want to do, hmm. or maybe it was a mistake to begin with. Maybe it just didn't sing loud enough. Yeah, well, getting it just another set of ears mm -hmm. can help you understand if you've made the right choice or if you're a little off track. Roger, this has been a lot of fun for me. Um, it's it's great hearing about how you work and um, the way you th the way you think about things, and um, I think it's just uh, it's such a great body of work, and it's fun to hear how you go about it. And it applies to just so many kinds of music making and a lot of life too. Just communicating <laughs> with people and and overcoming obstacles. I really do appreciate you taking the time to talk. Thank you. It's been fun. Wow, this has zipped by really quick. Really, really enjoyed oh, talking good. to you. Thank I'm you glad. for inviting me. I just get a little nervous. I'm keeping people too long. <laughs> <laughs> Is there anything else you want to touch upon before we wrap this up? Anything I forgot to bring up? Or, um, well, just I'll say I'm working now on a on a special for Cartoon Network called King Star King, which premieres I think on on um, Valentine's Day. Oh, cool. So six weeks from now. And um, so you know, that's my next thing to listen for. Okay. I'll make a note of that. Great. Well, I thank you very much. Um, I know I have your website for people if they want to check it out. It's just Roger Neal. And that has two L's just in case, you know, that's rogerneal.com. You can read up more about you and find out what you're up to. And uh, we'll put some stuff in the show notes too, some links to what we've been talking about. Thank you. But I thank you very much. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And thank you all for listening. Take care.